Family Theater presents Frank Lovejoy and Joan Leslie. From Hollywood, the Mutual Network, in cooperation with Family Theater, presents Gustafson, starring Frank Lovejoy. And now, here is your hostess, Joan Leslie. Thank you, Tony Lafrano. Family Theater's only purpose is to bring to everyone's attention a practice that must become an important part of our lives if we are to win peace for ourselves, Peace for our families and peace for the world. Family Theater urges you to pray. Pray together as a family. And now to our transcribed drama, Gustafson, starring Frank Lovejoy as Ed. I hadn't thought about him for three or four years, and I'd stopped wanting to think about him for a lot longer than that. And the more it faded into the past, the more I realized there wasn't anything I could do but keep it locked up inside me and learn to live with it. It wasn't easy, but at least for the first few years, I had the nightmares all to myself. I could wake up sweating and shivering at the same time and still be a little relieved that it was my red wagon, and only one other person knew I was pulling it. But then in 1948, I married Carol, and still the nightmares didn't stop. Oh, Ed! Ed, Ed, what's the matter? Gustafson, that's his dog tag. Ed, wake up, you're dreaming. Don't let him go, Gustafson, don't. Ed, wake up, wake up, Ed. What's the matter, honey? You were yelling in your sleep. I was. Who's Gustafson? What? You were talking about somebody named Gustafson. Oh. Uh, who's he? One of your clients? No, no, honey. It's, uh... I used to know a guy by that name a long time ago in the army. And you were dreaming about him? Yeah, I... I guess so. I don't know why. Are you sure everything's all right, Ed? Sure, sure, honey. You forget it. Forget it. I almost did, too. I thought I had it buried so far down underneath everything else that I wouldn't even recognize it if I saw it. And then just last Saturday, Saturday morning, something arrived in the mail that blew the whole thing wide open again. Oh, look, Ed. Hmm? It's a letter from Josie. Oh, good, good. More toast? No, you finish it up. There's other big envelopes from her, too. Oh, what is it? Photograph and clothes do not bend. Oh, probably a graduation picture. A graduation? Huh? She just started college a couple of years ago. (laughs) Exactly four. Oh, if this won't convince you your little sister's grown up, nothing ever will. What's that? She's engaged. Engaged? Uh Uh-huh, listen. I'm sending you a picture that Carl and I had taken together. He's really much better looking, and all the girls in the house are green with envy. What house? Sorority. Listen, Mother and Dad came up to school last month and met Carl and his mother, and everyone got on beautifully. Mm -hmm. We're going to be married sometime this fall, as soon as Carl gets definite word that his job with the department is set. He's the youngest assistant professor in the university, and he speaks better English than I do. So don't expect you'll be meeting someone just off the boat. Oh, what does that mean? Well, he's the same one she wrote us about last year. The exchange student from Germany. Carl. Carl Schramm. Oh, well, if he's okay with the folks, he's okay with me. Well, let's see what he looks like. Hmm? Well, the picture. That's probably what this is. Well, you enjoy yourself. I'm going to be late for work as it is. Bye. Mm. Oh, not bad. Not good, but not bad. Want to look at your future brother-in-law? Yeah, yeah. Let me see. Oh, here. Wow, he seems to be a... What's the matter? Don't you like Josie's taste in men? This, this guy, he's, uh... Well, what's wrong, Ed? I, I know him. I'm sure it's the guy. What guy? Let me see that letter again. Ed, what's this all about? Wait a minute, wait a minute. 
Carl, Carl, Carl Schramm. Doesn't say where he was born. You sure Josie said he was a German? Well, I showed you the other letter. Where is it? I threw it out. It was a year ago. I think she said he came from Dusseldorf or one of those places. Oh, that's the guy. I'm sure of it. Ed, you're not making any sense at all. I know him. I knew him back in Germany nine, ten years ago during the war. But are you sure? Oh, it's that's the guy. Listen, honey, I've got to see him. It's something I've never told you about, and I'm not going to tell you now, not until I'm sure, but I've got to see this man right away. Ed, if you're in any trouble... No, no, it's not any trouble. It's not the kind you think. Well, Ed, tell me, please, what is it? Look, as soon as I've left, call the folks and ask Mom if she'll drive over and spend the night with you. But I... She'll tell you. She knows all about it. I told her the whole thing the night I got home from overseas. What whole thing? About Gustafson. Just ask her that. Tell her I said it was okay. Ask her to tell you about Gustafson. <laughs> It was almost 7 o'clock that evening when I stepped off the train at the university station. I'd sent a wire ahead to Josie, my kid sister, and she was there to meet me. Ed, I'm just bursting with curiosity. Why are you down here? Well, it's, uh, it's about Schramm. Carl? The man you're engaged to. What about him? How long has he been over in this country? About two years. He came over here as an exchange student, and then they offered him an instructor's job and a year's fellowship in the science school. Why? Well, I think I know him. You know him? How could you know Carl? I recognized him from the picture you sent. I know him when he was a German soldier, a prisoner of war in Belgium. You were never a prisoner of war? Now, he, uh, he was the prisoner. Oh, Ed, you must be mistaken. No, I tell you, I recognized his picture. How old is he now? Twenty-six. Yeah, that fits. This kid was about sixteen or seventeen. Why do you want to see him? I just want to ask him something. Look, Eddie, I'm in love with Carl. The war's been over for a long time. Yeah, I know that. Mom and Dad have met him and his mother, and everything's rosy. So if you've come down here with a chip on your shoulder... I haven't got any chip on my shoulder. All I want is some information. I... I think Carl can help me. What kind of information? Well, it's something about what happened in Belgium almost ten years ago. How would he know about Believe it? Believe me, he might. He was there. But what's it about? Can't you even tell me that? Well, you remember when I first came back home in 46? Of course. Well, you were still in grammar school. I was in the eighth grade, I remember. You remember my talking to the folks about a soldier, an American soldier named Gustafson? Oh, I think so. Oh, wasn't that the, the boy from Minnesota you were so interested in finding? You got a good memory. He's the one. But I never did find him, even though I went back to his hometown to look. I still don't see where Carl comes into this. Well, I think he might be able to help me. But what could he know about an American soldier? He could know plenty. Believe me, honey. Ed, I don't like this a bit. You come in here and stir up a lot of dead I'm not ashes. trying to stir up anything, but it's important, Josie, and I can't tell you how important. I'm going to have to meet Carl sooner or later. I just want to ask him a few questions. Tonight? If you can arrange it. Well, all right. He's usually home from the lab around 8. I'll give him a call as soon as you finish eating. Mrs. Schramm told Josie over the phone that her son Carl wasn't expected home before 8.30. So to kill time, we took a walk around the campus. There was a new student commons at the south end of the quad, but the rest of it, the elm trees, the blinking lighted windows in the residence hall, the spring smell of new grass and fresh magnolia, that hadn't changed. It could have been 1941 all over again when I was Eddie Montgomery and the Alpha Delta House was the hub of the universe. But then we walked up Cushing Street, past the science building, where Josie told me Carl had his office. And I realized it could never again be 1941 or 1942 or 40 anything for Eddie Montgomery. It would always be now and from now on. And if Eddie was going to go on picking up the check for what it cost him to live with himself, at least he meant to find out what he was paying for, no matter who it hurt. Ed, please promise me you won't... I've already promised you. All right. It's just that I don't want anything... All right, to... all right, I promised. Josie! Hello, Carl. And this must be Ed. Glad to know you, Carl. Come in, come in. Mother! It's Josie and Ed! Just a minute! 
I hope we're not busting in on your dinner. Oh, nonsense. Here, let me take your coat, sir. I just uh, happen to be up this way, and I... You're the only member of the family we haven't met. Yeah, I have you. Thank you. Oh, Josie, how are you? I'm fine, Mrs. Schramm. I, I want you to meet my big brother, Ed. How do you do, Mrs. Schramm? So, you are Ed. Josie has told us all about you. <laughs> well, nothing complimentary, I trust. <laughs> oh, everything was a complimentary. <laughs> a compliment, Mother. Compliment. Well, everything was nice, Carl. That's what I mean. Come in, come into the living room. <laughs> Oh, Carl is always fixing my English. Josie, you must never have a son to be a professor. I promise. Well, I don't. Sit down, sit down, mm. Ed and Josie. Well, now we have met all the Montgomery's. Josie tells me you were a student here, Ed. Uh, uh, back in 41, before the war. Yes. Were you in the science school, like Josie? No, no, commerce major. Oh, they have a fine school here, I understand. Very fine. Ah, it's one of the best. It's Carl has some of them, the fresh ones. <laughs> Freshmen, mother. Yes, uh, freshmen in his survey course, don't you? Now, one class. Ed, it's required they take a science survey or mathematics. Yeah, I know. I wish I'd taken that when I was here instead of the math. Oh, did you flunk it? No, no, not quite, but I didn't make a high enough mark to qualify for V7. What is that? Uh, there's a Navy training program they had here during the war. Oh. Incidentally, Carl, you, uh, you served in the German army, didn't you? Yes. For a few months, very late in the war. Where were you captured? At Aachen. It... How did you know I was captured? Don't you remember me? Should I? I was stationed in Belgium during December 1944 in Namur. Namur? Really? I was an oncom with that signal outfit in the cavalry caserne. In the caserne? Where you used to do all the KP duty. Mother, Ed was one of the American soldiers where I was a prisoner. Can you imagine? It's... it's amazing. Uh, Josie, isn't that uh, incredible that your own brother should I could should hardly be... believe it when he told me, Carl. Ten years. Oh, and weren't we a sad spectacle? Well, I, I must admit you didn't look much like Superman. Mm, hardly. We were the scrapings at the bottom of the keg. The Volkssturm. Babies and old men. Well, it was pretty close to the end. Yes. Aachen was the first and last place we did any fighting. Just pathetic, that showing we made. Oh, I don't know. From what I saw of that place, you must have put up quite a scrap. At the beginning, yes, we tried to, but then... Carl, must we talk of the war tonight? I'm sorry, Mother. It's just... <laughs> it's just such an incredible thing that Ed and I should have been in the same place and that he should remember me after all these years. Now, don't tell me I haven't changed. Well, not much. Uh, a little heavier, perhaps. I... I must have made quite an impression. You did. But why? You remember what it was like that December, Carl, when your gang counterattacked and started to come back across the Meuse? Yes. The Battle of the Bulge, you call it. Yes, that's right. You remember how nervous everyone was around headquarters that first week of the battle when the rumor got out that the German soldiers were coming through the lines in American uniforms? I... I remember the rumor. Well, the night the rumor got out, you were working in the mess hall. You remember that? You were working in the chow line, pouring coffee. <laughs> Perhaps I was, but I don't understand. Well, I came through the chow line that night behind a soldier, an American soldier I had just met. He was a tall, dark guy with a long scar on his cheek and another on his forehead. You remember him? No. No, I can't say that I do. Eh, <laughs> da. I don't see how my Carl would remember an American soldier so long ago. I knew your mess sergeant, Falcon, and, and some of the cooks. But if this man was a stranger... I didn't say he was a stranger. But you said you had just met him. Oh, yes, that's true, but uh, he didn't seem to be a stranger to Carl. At the time, I had a feeling that they recognized one another. Ed, what are you driving at? I just want to know if Carl remembers the man. Well, how would he know an American soldier? That's why I'm asking. I don't understand you. Well, he wouldn't normally know a strange American, so I don't think the man was an American. I... I think he was a German wearing a G.I. uniform because Carl recognized him. Well, what if he was? What difference does it make? It makes a difference to me. Ed, this seems to be very important to you. Carl, uh, I, I know if you remembered such a thing, you would have told me, wouldn't you? Yes, Mother. But, uh, but you never did. No. So, all I can feel, Ed, is that you must be mistaken. Carl... Think hard. He was tall, he was about your height, but he had dark hair and scars on his face. Big ones. I... 
I'm sorry, Ed. I don't remember the men. Well. Well, thanks, anyhow. Josie, this is something you will have to face for a long time. The war? Every time Americans and Europeans get together, it is all they talk of. I suppose we'll get used to it, won't we, Carl? Yes, of course we will, dear. Well, well, now that we have had our talk of the war, how would you both like some hot coffee and schnick? Oh, wonderful. Ed, would you? Oh, oh, sure, sure, Carl, I'd love some. Then you both make yourselves comfortably. Comfortable, Mother. Comfortable. <laughs> Can I help, Mrs. Schramm? No, no, Josie. This is the night for the Schramms to make for the Montgomery's. But I'd like to. When I am your mother-in-law, you can wait on me all the time. Oh. But now we must make an impression. <laughs> <laughs> Come along, Carl. Do you take cream and sugar both, eh? Uh, just sugar, thank you. Same for me. No, I know all about you. <laughs> Heaven protect us. Mother. He doesn't believe you, Carl. I could see it in his face. Yes, I know. Why is he here? Why is he digging up the past? Oh, Mother, I, I wish I knew. Here, help me with the coffee things. We must not be too long. And, and I really don't remember him either. Perhaps he works for the United States government. No, I don't think so. Then why is he asking so many questions? Oh, Mother, I don't know. I don't know. He could be with the government. Josie told me he works for an insurance company. He could be with the government, too. Oh, it's possible, but... Mother, oh, you saw that letter from Aunt Nina. They're still trying war criminals in the West. Even but so. But few have been given amnesty, but many remain in prison and still others are yet being hunted. But after ten years... Oh, ten years does not matter, Carl. There is only one way out of this. You must deny everything. Mother, I... I think Josie could be trusted. No. He is her brother. They would make you an undesirable alien and you lose your job and your future. Maybe not. Why risk it? Why should he be punished now when it all happened so long ago? But it seems to matter so much to him, to Ed. It matters more to you. There is only one way. You must lie. <laughs> A few minutes later, Carl followed his mother back into the living room, carrying a tray of coffee cups and a plate of Schnecken. I could tell from the look on Mrs. Schramm's face that I'd gotten close to something. But I couldn't think of any way to reopen the subject until Josie gave me the chance. Josie? Schnecken? Thanks, honey. And you, Ed? It's very good. I made it myself. I can smell it's good. Thank you, Mrs. Schramm. Ed? Mm hmm I've stayed out of this so far, but... Well, now that you've asked Carl all your questions, would you mind telling me why you were so interested in this soldier you thought he knew? Well, like I told you, it's because I thought he was a German. But you never found out. No, I never did. Well, then what makes you think that he was a German? The way Carl looked at him. Ed, I've been thinking. Yeah? I got to know most of the men in your company except you. In fact, I'm surprised I don't remember you. Well, I was on detached service most of that time, Carl, with a signal outfit up in Liège. Oh, maybe that would explain it. He, the, the soldier, might have been a new man in your company at Namur, and, and you just didn't know him. No, no. No, he wasn't a new man. I knew that for sure. He was never connected with that company. He left the next day. And yet, after all these years, you're still looking for him? The soldier with the dueling scars on his face? I didn't know that they were dueling scars. <gasps> From the way you described them. Americans don't get dueling scars, Carl. I meant from a sport. Fencing, perhaps. You meant dueling scars like German students get. I assure you, I... He was a German, wasn't he? And you know it. No, I don't. Ed. You're lying, Carl. I'm not lying, and I'm not going to be bullied. Ed, you ought to be used to it. Your gang did plenty of bullying during the war. Eddie, stop it. The war's over. Not for me. What do you want? What are you after? I'm after the truth. I want to know if that man was a German. Why? What difference does it make? Are you hunting escape war criminals or something? No, I just want to know. I've been trying to find out for ten years. Ed, are you trying to implicate us because we are Germans? Is that why the war is not over for you? No, Mrs. Schramm, no. Do you still hate us so much? Eddie, this is enough. You've got to stop. I love these people. You've got to stop. All right. All right, I'll tell you. It's not, it's not because you're Germans, it's, it's because of something that I did. You did? Yes. 
It happened the second night of the battle, the night that I saw you working in the chow line, Carl. Yes? I just hitched a ride into headquarters from Liège that afternoon. I was picked up on the road by an American soldier driving a jeep, and he was all alone. He said his name was Gustafson, but there was something funny about him. Is, is that the Gustafson you were looking yes. for? Yes. What do you mean there was something funny about him? Well, for one thing, he told me he'd never been in Namur before, but when we got there, after dark, he drove through that town in the blackout without making one wrong turn and straight to headquarters. I see. I'd heard rumors up in Liège that afternoon about Germans in GI uniforms coming up through the lines to follow things up. The more I thought about it, the more it began to look to me as if this man Gustin might be a German. But couldn't you tell from the way he spoke? Oh, no, no. His English was perfect. And the way I figured it is, they wouldn't have picked him for the job if it hadn't have been. And this Gustafsson, he was the man with the scars? Yeah. And that night, when I saw the way you looked at him when he went through that chow line, I figured you must have recognized him from somewhere. As far as I was concerned, that clinched it. Well, didn't you report him? No, I... I never got a chance. What happened? Right after Chow, I got orders to leave for Reims. Gustafson said he was driving that way to Paris, and he'd give me a lift. It was about 10 o'clock when we left headquarters and started out of town, and, well, we drove for almost an hour without seeing or passing anybody. No road patrols, nothing. I made up my mind to turn him into the first officer MP we came across, but in the dark, even going through that villages, I didn't see a soul. All the time we were getting closer to Reims, and I had a feeling he knew that I suspected him. Well, if he did and I was right, I knew he'd try to stop me before I could report him. Well, he had his, his carbine lying on the floor of the Jeep between the two front seats, and I thought if I could get my hands on that and cover him, well, at least it'd be out in the open then. Depending on what he did after that, I'd know whether I was right or not. So you reached for his carbine? Yeah. My own was slung over my right shoulder. I'd taken the clip out and put it in the pocket of my field jacket during chow, but his was loaded. I made a grab for it on the floor, and I got one hand on the stock, and he hit me behind the ear with the heel of his fist. The jeep was doing about 40, and I would have fallen out of the barrel if the gun hadn't hooked under the seat. Then he hit me again across the mouth, and the gun came loose. Well, I, I felt it go off in my hands, and then I fell over backwards out of the jeep and hit the road and rolled into a ditch. When I climbed out of that jeep, it was piled up against a tree about 20 yards away. It all seemed to happen in an instant. And Gustafson? Well, when I... When I got to him, he was dead. I, and I found these around his neck. They had dog tags with an army serial number on them and the name Walter Gustafson in his hometown of Minnesota. Then, then he was an American. Well, that's the way it hit me at first, Josie, but I realize these might have been forged or maybe taken from a captive or a dead American soldier whose real name was Gustafson. So it left me nowhere. I see. That's why I want to know, Carl, about that man with the scars. I got to know what I did. Of, of course, but... It... You must forgive us. We didn't understand. I... I thought you were trying to hurt Carl somehow. I can tell you. Mother... Then Carl came home from the prisoner of war camp. He told me. He remembered the man with the scars. They had been in school together long before the war. Then... then he... he was a German. Yes. You're telling me the truth? I swear it. He was a German. An officer in the SS. I can't tell you how grateful I... I thought I'd killed an innocent man. I understand, Ed. Don't try. Was he a friend, a, a good friend of yours? No. He was not a friend. He was a fanatic. I often wondered what happened to him. It's almost a relief to find out. Well, I'll never... I'll never be able to... I'll never be able to thank you. You don't know what it's been like all these years. We can understand it. For you now, the war is over, no? Oh, yes, oh, yes. Finally. Good, good. And now, won't you try some of my schnecken? Mrs. Schramm was right. For Eddie Montgomery, the war was over. And as he sat there drinking coffee and looking at Josie and Carl and his mother, it came to Eddie that he was all through picking up the check for what it had cost him to live with himself. And that was good, too, because it had cost him plenty. But what Eddie forgot, and maybe it's just as well, is that when he walked out of that little white frame house on Cushing Street that night with his kid sister, Josie, he left the check behind him and it still had to be paid.
Well, Mother, now at least we know. Yes. I had a feeling he was dead all along. That night, that last night when I saw him dressed as an American, I somehow felt it was for the last time. Poor Eric. You weren't at all alike, Carl. Not in the slightest. It's hard to believe you were brothers. <laughs> This is Joan Leslie again. I think all of us have heard the expression, it's better to give than to receive. It means being kind, giving of ourselves and our services to others, performing those little acts of thoughtfulness and consideration that will make life more pleasant for those about us. You know, the unique thing about kindness is that it's something very contagious. A kind word or act on our part will not only bring happiness and encouragement to others, it will do more. It will inspire others to be kind. In a home, in a family, kindness helps so much. Being constantly thoughtful and considerate of the feelings and needs of one another makes a home the happy and contented place it should be. A place where all are working together in peace and harmony. To be truly kind, we must forget ourselves, have our thoughts on someone else, someone who is the source of kindness, God. And our thoughts are lifted to God by prayer, family prayer. So to bring kindness into your home, with all the blessings that flow from it, pray together as a family. Pray together today. Remember, the family that prays together stays together. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. From Hollywood, Family Theater has brought you transcribed Gustafson, starring Frank Lovejoy. Joan Leslie was your hostess. Others in our cast were Jean Bates, Irene Tedrow, Julie Bennett, and Tom Holland. The script was written and directed for Family Theater by John T. Kelly, with music composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman. This series of Family Theater broadcasts is made possible by the thousands of you who feel the need for this type of program, by the mutual network which has responded to this need, and by the hundreds of stars of stage, screen, and radio who give so unselfishly of their time and talent to appear on our Family Theater stage. To them and to you, our humble thanks. This is Tony Lofrano expressing the wish of Family Theater that the blessing of God may be upon you and your home and inviting you to be with us next week when Family Theater will present The 45 Caliber Teapot, starring Jack Benny. Mary Livingston will be your hostess. Join us, won't you? Family Theater is broadcast throughout the world and originates in the Hollywood studios of the world's largest network. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Mm -hmm.